Welcome to Worldwide Slot Card Chat, episode 18? Are we 19 yet? Eh, who cares? Uh, we're, I'm not going to make everybody do their introduction. I'm just going to kind of go through names. So when I call your name, just wave and say hi. And anybody who's not been on before, I don't see anybody who's not been on before. So if you're watching this episode and this is the first episode you're watching and you want to know a little bit more about this, the uh, slot car related history of each of our regular guests, Go watch previous videos. Start with video number one. That's a good place to start. So Kelly, go ahead and say hi. Wave hi. There's Kelly Avery. Looks like he might be a little lagged or slow. Uh, John Kitt is here. Hey, John. And Russ Paver, my, one of my local racer friends. Uh, old Slot Racer, a.k.a. Luff Linkert, is there. Wave Luff. There he is. And he's got his friend there. And Mr. John Underwood from the U.K. And uh, Richard, Mr. Modifier from the U.K., and Leo Capaldi, did I, did I say that right? All right, hey Leo, and Lance, camera and everything, and Mr. Waltmeister, thanks for coming again. And that's pretty much it for intros. Does anybody have any show and tell? I was working on models or, oh, looks like Lloyd's joining us, so thanks for joining us today, Lloyd. <clears throat> uh, does anybody have any show and tell or anything they want to talk about? Not seeing any. Does anybody have any questions or anything they want to loop back from a previous chat? Great, great. I do have some footage of the, uh, you know, the tow truck I shared with you two weeks ago. I've got some Alrighty. footage of it uh, running, but uh, presumably I can share my screen, can I? Uh, yeah, I'll make that happen. Give me a second. Give me a couple of minutes to tear that and I'll give you a shout when I'm ready. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen anytime. Carry on. I just need to find it first. I mean, there's nothing to carry on with yet. <laughs> unless, unless there's somebody who's, who just just picked something out of their off of their shelf they want to show off or something. I don't know. Lloyd, do you want to talk about what's happening in the 143rd world? Did you have your uh, Did you have a successful 143rd chat yet? Can you hear me, all right? Yep. Yeah. Um, well, we had a chat last night, and the only other visitor was Leo who you have on there tonight. <laughs> um, we had one other chap try to get on, uh, Bob, but um, unfortunately couldn't make his machine connect. But I was going to talk to you about that um, off uh, sometime and see whether we, um, it was something I was doing wrong or whether he was doing it. Uh, I mean, if, if anybody was able to join, then it probably wasn't anything on your end. Uh, mm -hmm. The most common thing is having the waiting room activated and not allowing something not allowing somebody in from the waiting room. Easiest thing yeah. to do is just turn off the waiting room and then kick him out. Yeah, he, we could see him, but he couldn't hear. He he was not hearing anything, and we couldn't hear him. So yeah, so that's some that's a technical issue on his computer. You yeah. unlikely to have been doing anything on your side. Yeah, um, the the timing uh, didn't work out for some people because we got uh, about at least three more people that, who would have been on, but they were working yeah, or somewhere else. The problem is they're out of phase. So they're, <laughs> yeah, I, I, lagging I forgot. So, that one, so I, I, I need to watch out for a reminder. Uh, but yeah, I mean, your best bet is to, is to do, is to, is to get on early and, and just kind of help people through the process if they're there. And, but sometimes yeah. you just can't, you just got to let them figure it out on their own. Well, you know, I, I you, had to, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had the problem myself. I didn't know how to start it all at the beginning, but uh, Leo was on there, so we had an adder for a while. And uh, next week, uh, there's others will never go, so we'll, we'll try it. Cool. All right. Hopefully, uh, I don't miss the reminder. You ready, uh, Richard? Uh, yes, I am, hopefully. So if I click on share screen, presumably I then pick the screen I actually want to share. Yep. There we are. So can you see something that says Tojo on the road? Yep. All right, there we are. It's only about 90 seconds long. So that's the super fast um, Matchbox 164 oh. scale that I started with. Drew it up, modelled it in my CAD package, having used my micrometer to take measures. Uh, he even came up with my own printed wheels with inserts, and there she is flying around the track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So I put my own urethanes on it, so the grip's actually quite good. This is without magnets. You can see the two babies side by side. Is that at speed? That's at speed, yeah. That thing's, it's quick. Yeah, it's um, it's about the same speed as uh, as my DTM Carrera um, before I tuned it. It weighs about ninety grams, so it's never going to be um, it's never going to be super fast. The motor is a, a Pendle Slots twenty um, k motor with about one hundred twenty grams of torque, so nothing um, uh, nothing major uh, motor wise. Uh, it's probably about it's, it's probably ten percent, twenty percent more power than a standard Skeletrix car, but you don't want any more because if you if you carry too much speed, it just rolls over on the bends. So, uh, but then the thing is, if you uh, I don't know whether you can see uh, on the camera here, but the the guide blade is a fair distance in front of the front axle. So actually, although the wheelbase is only 70, about 70 millimeters, I think the distance from the rear axle to the um, pivot point of the guide blade is about 95 millimeters, which is a decent, de decent distance. Now, uh, are, are your milk floats that fast as well? Uh, the milk float, on, on that lap, um, the tow truck laps in about 9.8 seconds and the milk floats um, no, the, sorry, the, the tow truck is 9.3 and the milk floats are 9.8. So the, yeah, the milk floats are about half a second slower, um, but they have um, standard Skeletrix rubber on them. So I think if I were to swap to urethanes, uh, they'd probably be about the same sort of uh, speed, they're the same sort of weight. So, I mean, they're, yeah. pre they're pretty quick. Obviously, the 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 tallness you know makes them prone to rolling. So you got to take the corners slower. But otherwise, yeah, there's not a huge like, amount. There's not a huge amount of weight up top. Having said that, doesn't right, have yeah. to be. <laughs> yeah, compared compared to an LMP, yes. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean the the chassis itself. Uh, although there's no, uh, there's a little bit of give. There's height adjustment on the on the chassis. So the front. Um, axle actually moves in a, uh, a horizontal oval and there's grub screws coming in from above and below so you can adjust the height of the axle so the the wheels are just touching um, but there's about um, probably one one and a half millimeters of vertical play so on a plastic track it allows for the bumps in the track so it doesn't get unsettled if you have if you have your front axle set up too tight then it can actually unsettle the car or even force you to lose contact with the braids on, on the rails. So having a little bit of movement. So it is effectively a tripod going round. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you know, no magnets um, sort of helps. It's, um, it would be a lot quicker with magnets, obviously, but I, our club doesn't run magnets at all. So uh, in some ways you can actually go, you, if you slow down into the corner, let it weight up the front so that it digs in nicely, and then you just feed the power in as you come out. So you uh, just created a new sort of category for racing. Yeah, <laughs> I think if I were to put, I think the milk, the, the milk floats have actually got a standard Skeletrix motor in. So if I were to replace them with the Pendle slot motor, that Pendle's motor is great. If you guys ever get, you know, a, 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 and obviously shipping across the pond is expensive, but the motors are only four pounds fifty each. So I guess what's that, six dollars, if that. Yeah, that's know. pretty good. But, they're a 20k motor, about 120 grams of torque, and um, they're just that little bit more than a Skeletrix motor. Depends on your racing. Uh, you know, around a wooden track, it would be laughable, but on the technical scale, if you've got an R1 somewhere and you, your longest straight is no more than four meters, then a 20k motor is good enough. <laughs> I've driven 40ks on my track. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But presumably you've got a a, a, a three tooth uh, pinion and a thirty tooth spur gear. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody brought uh, like an, an NSR Mosler that had uh, had a hop up motor that was just crazy fast. And uh, I don't know whoever's not familiar with my track. It's a very tight technical track with multiple sections, including R one yeah. radius turns. And uh, yeah, that was that was fun. It. I mean, yeah, any car. I, I the faster motors generally aren't the quickest. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've got an open class uh, that we race. I don't know whether you've seen the fiber slots cars, but 
but we've got we have uh, we have an open slot uh, where open okay so we have a control tire and motor that's sort of control control tire but the motor is free choice um but uh most guys find that a 22k motor is about the optimum 25k and you're not using the top end then you actually begin to lose controllability in the mid-range and that's what it's all about on a technical track you need to have I'd have preferred to have something with mid-range controllability than with you know something that's just too fast uh, and we find that a 25 30k motor you try and go around the hairpins then it's really hit and miss uh, and somebody with a less powerful motor will catch you up on the technical bits you go past them on the straight they go past you on the bends yeah, so I think there is, uh, it's interesting having an open class that most people have ended up going with a 22k motor with about 200 grams of, of torque. Anything more than that uh, becomes too difficult to control. Yeah, we were definitely turning down our knobs when we were racing that little, that car around my track. <laughs> yeah. Turn the sensitivity way down, turn, the, turn your curve way down. Yeah, that's always, that's always a challenge. Hey, Wayne, thanks for joining us. Well, does anybody else have any show and tell they want to? Oh, and now we got, uh, I don't think, how do you say that? Oris? Aris? I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, it's a default. It's not, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just never changed the name. Oh, you should be able to change it, or I can change it for you if you want. I, I, I've got one thing if anybody wants to see it. It's, right, it's um, okay, it's, hopefully you can see it. It's uh, Sally Stokes. Hopefully, let's see if that comes. Yeah, sorry, I, we've had this problem before. Uh, just finished the, the the sculpt and threw it in some some rubber. Here we go. Uh, Try putting uh, your hand right behind the, the you know picture, what, that's a good idea. going all the way up to the camera. Whoops! How's that? Give it a sec. Stop moving. Just give it a sec. Oh, go. Go <laughs> that's that's very detailed. Did your yeah. daughter do that? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the young eyes and the young hands, I'm afraid, took over. The, the, this I did, I just painted this. This is just Graham Hill to go on the in the pits, which is an immense miniature's head and nice monogram nice. body and some nice. uh, leftover arms from someone I don't even know who. But uh, but Sally turned out really well and. Uh, she, uh, she especially was really interested in her because um, Sally apparently was about her size. She's about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, and that's about the height of our daughter. So she went, oh, that's kind of neat. So she made those a while ago. And then she said, Dad, have you cast it yet? I went, no. So I finally got around to it and painted one up to see what it would look like. So it turned out quite well. Now I just have to do Clark. Hey, that's Richard, it. are you going to uh, make those 3D prints available for the tow truck? I keep getting asked that. I I need to do a little bit of work um, to get it to a point where uh, it'd be easy to assemble. So yeah, I'm I'm in two minds for how to uh, make that available. But I had to do a bit of uh, physical trimming to get the first one going. So I I need to. Um, the problem is with your printer is getting the tolerances right, uh, and it, that depends to some extent on the thickness of your wall. So it's getting the settings right so it's predictable. So yeah, I think I probably would make it available. Um, uh, it's on Thingy Thingiverse is probably the best place, is it, to put them? Uh, that's the biggest. Um, the the one that I've also been uh, posting things to from time to time is the prusaprinters.org because uh, they get a pretty good repository of uh, modeling and, and a good way to do it. And you can actually, if you have a Thingiverse account, you can create a, an account on prusaprinters.org and they have a tool to import your Thingiverse things to Proof Printers. Oh, All right. you can do is review it and approve it. If I was to make a suggestion for your preparations for releasing the model, I would say uh, don't account for people's poorly configured printers. Mm -hmm. Design the model such that, I mean, honestly, when I print things, if there's if there's any tolerance above 0.1 millimeters, it's loose. So when I design things, I design them to have zero tolerance. If it's multi if it's pieces that go together, even if they're sliding in and out, you know, like a peg into a hole, uh, I, I design for zero tolerance because when I print those things, they come out the size that they should be. And so the peg goes in the hole. Uh, if, if the peg doesn't go in the hole, then 
your printer is out of whack. It's not a problem with the model, it's a problem with the printer. And everybody, everybody's printer is gonna be differently out of whack, right? So you can't, if you, if you make, if you design your model to be printed with your printer, it's not gonna work on my printer necessarily, or it's not gonna work on somebody else's printer necessarily because, you know. I think anybody, anybody building this is probably gonna to need to accept that they're gonna to have to have some reasonable modeling skills because of the amount of um, uh, fettling and so on. I made the holes a little bit undersized, but then I prefer to drill them out by hand. Yeah. Um, so I get a good, uh, I get a good purchase from the screws. And sometimes I've got size zero screws. Sometimes I've got size one screws, you know, so it, it, it really, it really depends on that front. Yeah. Um, and I think most people who would print that kind of model understand that that kind of fettling is necessary. Yeah. They're not going to be mad that it, that it doesn't just go together like a snap tight. I guess so. <laughs> I guess the other thing is, if you want the windscreen, obviously you can't print that. Uh, and uh, so I, uh, I guess I would have to publish a PDF or something with the, uh, with the template. It's a fairly straightforward template. Um, yeah, but you need, a, you need a little bit of brass rod and a, and a, and a hand vise to, um, to clamp it up and bend it properly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm late to the party. What are you, can you show me what you're talking about, Richard? Oh, okay. That's very nice. Almost looks like a scaled up Hot Wheels. Yeah, it is a scaled up Hot Wheels. This is its baby brother. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What you didn't see in the video is that had headlights and the uh, LED lights on the roof work. Uh, it runs around the track really neat. If you watch the YouTube video for, uh, I believe it's, uh, what's your YouTube video uh, channel? Oh, it's um, Roots, go to Roots One Racing. Route one racing, yeah. Route with a you route. see it going around the track. Uh, I don't know if it was my buffering, but I couldn't really see the truck go around the, the track today. But I saw it last week. It was really neat looking. Well, yeah, the, the only trouble I had with the um, with the, the the lights on top, although they are constant orange, just supposed to flash. And when you put a constant DC current in, they do flash. But because obviously I'm running digital, I had to put um, a diode in which basically takes half of the AC wave and feeds it. But I think the gap is so big that effectively the LEDs are resetting, um, you, know, so it's, you know, 60 times a minute. So I'm going to have to build a, a, a rectifier, a bridge rectifier to feed it in on both sides of the wave. Um, then it will flash because I've had that before on LMP cars. I've put a flashing um, uh, red light in the rear center of an LMP car. Uh, and uh, when I just put, um, I put it on a bridge rectifier um, which is basically four diodes arranged so that depending, you know, fast switching diodes, you get a constant DC out of an AC curve. It flashed perfectly. So I'm going to have to, um, I'm going to have to uh, get in there and rewire it. But there is actually plenty of room. If you look in the back, there is, there is a ton of room inside that beast to fit a chip and wiring and all sorts of, uh, all sorts of goodies. So it's fairly, it's a fairly straightforward thing. But yeah, I just need to get the instructions clear because if people are going to build them, it would be a shame to print all the parts and then not be able to um, have the full effect. I certainly yeah, won't discourage you from doing that. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people um, uh, recognize the, the tow truck, which is great. Uh, I'm not sure about the milk floats. The milk floats are probably uh, more of a British peculiarity. I don't think they, uh, I don't think any, people recognize what they are from anywhere else. Correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, I didn't recognize it until you had shown it, but that doesn't mean it's not worth putting out there. <laughs> you got all those people well, in Britain who recognize it. Or, or Richard, if anybody's a Monty Python fan, yeah. I'm sure they'd recognize it. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, what was the other one? It was um, Father Ted, wasn't it? Father Ted as well, right? Yeah, then when they're, they're takeoff of speed. <laughs> Yeah, I just need, I need to get around to, I think once I've, uh, once I've, um, the thing is, it's, it's finding the time to do these things. I think that, uh, you know, I wouldn't be averse to, to sharing them on Thingiverse. It's just getting around to, um, uh, and, and to putting the instructions together. But yeah, I think um, a little bit of refining. I need to recess the front so that the, um, the, the glass sits in a bit carefully. There's about half a millimetre difference in height. So the glass just sits inside a lip, but I think I'm going to lower the um, the interior by about a millimeter, which gives you a bit more of an edge 
for the glass to sit in comfortably. Um, yeah, it's finding a it's finding a glue, but uh, I didn't have any canopy glue. But I managed to do a very thin bead of epoxy resin, which seems to hold it quite nicely. Uh, but yeah, I think if you're used to scratch building, then then assembling one of these is is a piece of cake. If if you're used to just putting together simple snap together kits, then it's probably a step too far. I think, like I said, I think if if a person has a 3D printer and they're printing it out. They're, they're, they're good with a little bit of uh, slicing and drilling and sanding and stuff. Yeah, fair enough. So Dennis has joined us uh, and Wayne joined us uh, a, a little earlier. Uh, do either one of you guys have anything that you want to show and tell or talk about? Because I, I had asked that before you got here. <laughs> uh, not for me today, just an apology for being late. I was busy trying to fix some controllers for one of our local races. Oh, I... tell us about that. It's it's a it's one of those things that the true speed controllers and I'm the only guy around here who, who, who uses them uh, apart from one or two others uh, and I've done some work on them before but for me it's a, it's a really suck it in the sea thing because I'm not an electronics guy so I go in there and uh, in the past they said well probably the MOSFETs have blown so I'll replace all the MOSFETs and if it doesn't work then I'm then I'm stuck. Then I got to go back to the supplier and say, or back to the manufacturer and say, Steve, please tell me, yeah, you know, what's going on here. Uh, so I'll just have to wait and see. But that's it. I'm I'm like the modern auto mechanics, you know, that they just plug and play. Uh, I have absolutely no uh, knowledge to actually diagnose what's wrong with a specific component. If I can't see that something's blown or burned uh, or mechanically damaged, then uh, I'm at a loss. But anyway, so that was what I was doing, and that's why I'm late, so my apologies. <laughs> well, no worries. There's, there's, you're never see, late. <laughs> yeah, I see Mark Gerard on today. Haven't seen or heard from him in many years. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hey, Dennis. Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, long time no see, man. <sighs> Mark, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I've been running slots off and on for about, I don't know, 20 years or so. Um, I got quite a few, uh, quite a few of, uh, Dennis's hand-built chassis under my cars. Um, but yeah, I did, I run with a club out here in Denver, Colorado. We've got a pretty good group. Dennis was part of us for a little while. Then he moved to California. Uh, yeah, a long but, time back. It's like 2006, I think. So it's yeah. 14, 14 years. We've both aged a little since then. Yeah. You look a little better than I do, though. Oh well, it's 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 Colorado living for you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, it's, primarily one thirty second or one twenty four. Oh uh, yeah, about one thirty second. I've got about close to four hundred slot cars, and maybe thirty of those are close to thirty of those are one twenty fourth. But I run the gamut from most, some, you know, scaly F1, got a bunch of those, SRC F1s. I like rally cars. I like old GP cars. I built a bunch of stuff from Penelope Pit Lane and uh, George Turner's stuff. And like I said, I got, you know, I'll send D Dennis a, uh, Dennis a body and he throws up an awesome chassis under it. And he, he built me, uh, how do I get to, show a bit of something that I've got of his. It's pretty cool. Just hold it up in front of the camera and I'll make your picture bigger. Okay. So it's it's oh, a it's, a, it's yeah. a scaly you remember this one Dennis? Yeah I remember it's that a scaling one. um mini and I was like I want to use the 10 inch wheels and I, I gave him a polycar uh F1 uh motor with the right. motor yeah. and he Cut it. It wouldn't work because the chassis, the, the wheel sat a little high in the chassis. So he made a brass motor pod for it, still using the lay down gears and the motor. So, I mean, that's, that yeah, doesn't make it. Much. Yeah, you don't see it from underneath, but above yeah. that, above that little plate that's below the that's below the rear wheels is a full set of the polycar uh, transfer gears. Yeah. So uh, I had to make and you know, I had to measure up and cut new side. Uh, side plates that the polycar bearings fitted in uh, it it took a little bit of time <laughs> yeah. but it was a fun project i love those kind of projects those 
the challenges. He sent me a he sent me a C type Jaguar at one stage too, and I managed to cram an angle winder underneath that, um, which was not that easy. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm the scourge of the. I run with the vintage uh, guys out here too, and they they actually did a rule. They said no more brass chassis, and that was because of Dennis. Oh yeah, there was a time they found they found a bunch of of uh, resin Mini Coopers with big flares on them, and Mark had one built, and then a friend of his at the club saw that one, and I think he had four of them built eventually, but those things were rockets, man, because they you know they were they're pretty wide, pretty much the whole of an eight millimeter tire would have been outside of the original body, so big were the flares. And so it made it pretty easy to, to, to put a full, a full blown um, si uh, angle winder underneath those. But we they were ran, fun to drive. We ran a, a, a Hawk 14K in those things, and they were, because yeah. it was for the vintage club class, the, of, they called them mini cars. And we had a width and a, uh, we had a track and a whatever uh, limit. And the, had they known what we were pulling out, they would have made the cars definitely narrower. <laughs> Because we, uh, Tim and I, we've got the other fellow that Dennis built the chassis for. We pretty well dominated that class. And they're more about, they get upset if you win con consistently. They'd rather you just be out there showing your cars off and the work you did as opposed to racing them. And I guess we didn't get that memo. But, mm -hmm. but the, the, the racing in Colorado is very, is, was very interesting to me because it was one of those places where uh, certainly the the the, um, the the more modern club had a very nice set of rules and uh, it, it, it they were pretty simple uh, and everybody got together like twice a year and changed the the they didn't you didn't change the class you you had a type of car meaning it was either box stock or you had limited modifications to it or you had something that was full blown uh, do anything you like but then they would they would create a genre for a series, like it would be, um, you know, F and FG and H production uh, SCR, uh, SCCA cars, and you could put anything you like, but any car you liked and any any manufacturer you liked, but it had to be within, let's say, those those limited modification rules, and it worked really really well. Uh, it didn't mean that we bought a lot of cars. But it was a, it was it was a very fun way of doing things. Um, it was some of the more sensible rules that I've come across for racing 132 cars. What kind of rules did they use to help that wide disparity of cars race together? Uh, I should really let Mark talk about that. But as I recall, there was a box stock class that we almost never ran. Uh, there was a box stock plus class where you could change out the 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 guide and the tires, I seem to remember, nothing else. And then there was a limited class where you could change the guide, the axles, the wheels, the tires, the gears, but not the motor. And then there was an unlimited class where you could put in um, any kind of motor, any kind of chassis. It could be a brass chassis. It could be a, a 3DP chassis, although the days that I was running there, we didn't have those. And so... Uh, within that, then, you know, you would design according to the tracks because we, we had, what, five or six tracks around. They're mostly, in those days, they were plastic. And, uh, and we all used silicone tires. So you would design around that. And uh, uh, I felt that it worked pretty well. It certainly managed to accommodate people like me, uh, who is a builder and a modifier, as well as, uh, as people who uh, just like to tinker on plastic car that they bought over the counter. We're, we're pretty well that way now. We've, we've expanded the class a little, the classes a little bit where we run two classes per event and we keep the classes for three months at a time or we stagger it so you're not buying two cars every three months. It's you know, a car, it, then a month later you buy another car, but then we revisit, you know, we always go back to our old standbys like Trans Am and uh, like Carrera DTMs, which is probably the only Carreras we'll ever run. But yeah, it's a pretty good class. We try a uh, club. We try to keep it varied. We've got a few wood tracks coming in the mix, which is really nice. And we still we have a local hobby shop that has a 
four lane car painted Carrera track in the basement, which is sort of our main club. So we're one of the lucky ones. And uh, it's open as far as, it's not really a commercial track, but anybody can walk down there and rent a controller and rent a car for like five bucks and run. But obviously we haven't done any last, our last slot meeting where we got together was March 8th. We had an Enduro, uh, slot at Group C Enduro and we're, everybody's jonesing to get back into running slots. But with this COVID thing, who knows when that's going to happen. Do you guys have any classes that somebody on this in, in the same race might be running a front motor fly and another person in the next slot over would be running a sidewinder scaly or something or? Oh, uh, we've, the only time we've run into something like that, I mean, obviously you can run whatever you want if the class is right, but people know the disadvantage of running a heavy front motored fly car. Uh, like in the Trans Am class, all the guys went with, with the usual Camaros and Mustangs by Scaly and the stuff, the, the top heavy cars like Pioneer, their Mustangs and Camaros. And I ran a Fly 911 rear motor and I had to run about, so all, I can't remember, it's something ridiculous, almost like seven ounces up front to get, you know, to get a 50-50 balance. I'm a top three car, but I'm, I wouldn't win. But yeah, we, we try to accommodate pretty well whatever you like because not all guys have you know hundreds of cars in their slot box a lot of guys do what we did way back when is well i always wanted a dodge charger and then i never could afford it so i bought one as a slot car and generally they don't make good slot cars so yeah. a lot of guys that show up with you know their dream car garage in their slot box they're great to look at but they just don't run well and we also we also accommodate new guys where if they're because we're works completely non-magnet silicon tires. But if you're new, you want to run a magnet, you don't have anything. If you you know if you don't want to run a loaner car, run your car. If you start beating people with a magnet, then we'll teach you how to run non-magnet. But so we we try to take care of everybody as much as we can. We've got a 13-year-old kid that was, you know, he came with his dad. Now he's beating his dad, which is great. And uh He's winning a few heats now and then. So, you know, we, we have, a, you know, we have no secrets. If, if we're faster, we'll bring you up with us. You know, there's no fun being the top dog year on, year in, year out. You know, you, that, that discourages people from wanting to run. And plus you just, you want to get people to bring, bring faster people along with you. So it works out, I think. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good philosophy, Mark. I totally agree with that. Um, because uh, I, I, I have been at a point where I won every class one year and I thought it's actually no fun because it doesn't give anybody else half a shout. So I've made my cars open. If anybody wants to see what I've done to my car, I'll quite happily take the body off and, uh, and show them and say, this is what I did. Uh, I will even, um, I've started doing a little bit of tuning. So occasionally some of the guys come round to my house uh, and will actually show them what they're doing wrong they end up you know you find out that they've put a sidewind opinion on a inline car and wondering why their gears are binding and things like that not realizing that there are different diameters of pipe, uh, opinion uh, what we with our with our club we try we've we've got four classes that we run each year and then each year we'll change two classes so each class will run for two seasons for two years uh, and then uh, and then we'll swap it around so nobody has to buy too many cars um, and the, the old retired favorites will bring them out for the odd endurance race so we'll have three or four events in the year where we'll, we'll bring back a past class a past favorite from a couple of years ago like v8s or trucks and we'll race them on a two-hour um, endurance race you know or something with with teams of two or three people which can, which can be fun but we found a good way of evolving a class um, to get uh, to get six years out of it we started off with um, with the scale it's classics you know, you'll recognize the 260z uh, and you'll recognize the mg maestro which uh which drives like a pig by the way they're rare and they're rare because they're totally hopeless <laughs> but the 260z is very nice um, we ran those basically with a with a with a bog standard scaly motor then the following year we made it a tuning class to do what you liked with it uh, and then uh, this year uh, we found, I don't know whether you've discovered fiber slots, but you can take all of the running gear out of your old scaly classic car and put it on a fiber slot chassis, 
He's on the he's on Facebook. So the chassis costs what twelve pounds, I think, for the chassis. Uh, what about fourteen, fifteen dollars? And the uh, vac form bodies, two pounds fifty. So what three dollars? Three dollars fifty. So he does a, an Austin A thirty five. He does a Morris Minor, which is quite cute. Um, he does a Volkswagen Beetle. So we've so the third incarnation. It was it was box standard box standard uh, Scaly Classics. Uh, then then tune it however you like, and now take all of your running gear and shove it into um, and shove it into uh, a fiber slot chassis and body shell. Uh, and so we've got six years out of the same cars. All right, you might have had to buy a motor and some alloys, but um, it's, it's been very entertaining. And it's actually taught the guys a lot about what makes their cars go well, because they've taken a stock car, figured out that the, um, the scalies will fall over like mad unless you tube the front axle. So we showed them how to tube the front axle. In the second, the second season, we uh, said, we'll try it with a hotter motor. And that's when we discovered a 25K motor. You can't live with it. Um, especially in a mini, you've got a 1275 mini with a short wheelbase, then it just ends up facing the wrong way a lot of the time. Um, so it's finding the optimum motor. And then we've taken our optimized running gear and shoved it in a new format. Um, and, and these, I don't know whether you can see the chassis, but it's actually machined, um, it's actually machined out of flat planes. So it comes literally very flat packed. Uh, and the, 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 cross, the cross members for mounting the motors you can run it with a short can or a long can because he's got different uh, locating holes for the cross members to sit in and it's all held together with some small um, bars across and I actually 3D printed a plastic one in front to put a digital chip because there was no way to put a chip um, but yeah it's, uh, it's, it's, it's surprisingly good chassis it's, it's very rigid uh, but it's basically machined out of I guess what looks like um, PCB board, but Did without the, carbon fiber. Um, it's probably regular PC board. Fiber, yeah, fiber, fiber spot PC kind board. of tells me that it's carbon fiber, and, yeah. and when I looked at pictures, it looked like carbon fiber. Yeah, it, it looks very similar to the old ProTrack one that used to be available in the states some years back. Good idea. Yeah, it's, it's a good chassis. He, uh, he did make, this is an early one because you can see the uh, on the rear the the. Um, Axel sits in from uh, from above, but I actually on I got him to change it. He, he's now actually got it so that the axle pushes out from underneath. Because we are finding with heavy-handed marshals, sometimes your axle will pop, uh, and it, and with, when you feed up the axle from underneath, there's no way it's going to pop. Um, and if it does, it's very easy to relocate it. So uh, yeah, apart from that, but um, yeah, it's, um, I, I thoroughly recommend it. They are they are surprisingly quick. It's a very rigid. Um, chassis and there's no vertical movement in the front axle but for whatever reason um, it really flies but I think it's probably because the whole package weighs well you know the, the body weighs probably five grams the whole package probably weighs no more than 40 grams so they are really quick really entertaining as well and no magnets so basically you get from him the the, the chassis kit and you can get a back form body, body of whatever design yes, and then yeah. take all your parts out of your Skelectric and drop it into that. Drop it in, yeah, just a, just a straight uh, a straight drop in. Um, so yeah, we've basically recycled. We've had, uh, we've had um, we're gonna have six seasons out of a single car and a second motor, basically. Uh, yeah, and I think his range is incredible. He's got um, yeah, the old Austin 30, A35, the A14, Morris Minor, Beetle, Ford Anglia. Um, he also does a Capri, uh, no, there's a Beetle as well. He does a Capri, but that's a longer wheelbase, and we haven't allowed that because it is significantly longer and would be more far more stable. Um, but yeah, he's he's got uh, oh, a stiletto, Sunbeam stiletto. So there's there's quite a there's quite a variety. Uh, it just fact back formed out of white um, PETG, dead easy to prep. Uh, there's even there is an interior tray, which is a a bit tricky to uh, to carve it the right shape, but yeah, it's um it's uh, it's, it's good fun. It's very rustic. Uh, you know, the body's screwed in on on the side, so you know it's not per it's perfect because you've got these massive great screws holding the body on. But um, it has an agricultural charm to it. 
That's super cool. And, it, and it's fiber, is it F-I-B-R-E or F-I-B-E-R? Uh, F-I-B-R-E, yeah. The, the British spelling, I'm afraid. Fiber slots. He's on, he's on Facebook. Uh, yeah, and he's, uh, yeah, he's, um, uh, I think he built them originally because he wanted to do old um, hot rod racing, which is basically oval racing in the UK. Uh, but yeah, we found them to be, um, yeah, to just generally very entertaining cars. Have you shared your little uh, digital chip part for people to print? Um, yeah, I, well, I've basically told Mark, uh, he's, he's featured it on his um, his uh, website, and I've said if people want any, um, then let me know. But I not think that I don't think that many people are chipping them. I think they tend to be the oval racing community. Uh, but yeah, again, that's something I can probably shove on uh, on Thingiverse. That's that's good to go. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I, I should share that. That'd be easy enough to do. It just replaces the metal cross member, which gives you somewhere non-conductive to mount your chip. Cool. Yeah, I might have to grab one of those. I, I always like to play with different things. You know, if I. <laughs> If something new comes out, it's it's fun to just kind of experience it. That's what's so awesome about proxies, you know, especially open proxies. You get just all kinds of crazy stuff you get to yeah. see and play with. Does anybody else have anything they want to? Hey, Russ, go ahead. Yeah, I I just thought I'd try a screen share and kind of give you guys an idea of my track here at the yeah. house. And um these are some of the guys racing on it, and we'll see how it comes out for you. All right. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. When you when you click share, then it you you got to click whatever window you want to share. Okay, I've got desktop one, but it's got an exclamation point there. Let me see what happens when I do it here. Yeah, basically when I click on share, it just pops up a window with all of the different windows for me to choose from. Have you got your video already teed up? Yes. Okay, so when you click on share, it should show you lots of little windows, including your video. And if you can see a miniature of your video, if you click on that when you share, it should show it to us. Well, at the top, I've got basic, advanced, and files. Yeah. And then below that, I've got desktop one, whiteboard, iPhone, and do you have anything under that? Uh, I've got system preferences, QuickTime player, and Finder, but I don't actually see my desktop. What At happens the, very the, bottom, the, quick, the QuickTime yeah. player might be what you're playing your video from. Yeah. Click on that. Right. Gives me a thing that says allow Zoom to share your screen. Yep. Open system preferences and security and privacy. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Windows is trying to protect. <laughs> uh, is it is it a video that you've got on your on your new Facebook page or uh, YouTube? Uh, okay. Because I can bring up your page and and pick any other videos that you've shared. All right. Let me see if I can. I'm going to go grab some lunch. I'll see you guys next Wednesday. <laughs> All right, love. Thanks okay, for coming. See you guys. Sorry, love. Um, okay. All right. Maybe I can't do it. Tell me what video you want me to play. I'll, I'll do it. Okay. I'm looking at your video oh. selection on your page. You've got PSSRA. Uh, you want me to just pick one of the ones with PSSRA? Um, yeah, it probably doesn't matter. Whatever you think is good there. Are, 
Let's see, track pro cleaner. Hi, Russ. Here we go. Hey, Tony's there. Oh, hold on, let me pause hey, that. Hi. All right, give me a sec here. That uh, 185357 movie is okay, one. Can you guys see this? Yep. Okay. Is this a can you hear the audio? Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. Oh, no. <laughs> Ooh. Pretty jerky. <laughs> oh, don't worry. It'll it'll look good. Uh, you know what, uh, Greg? If you can put pick an earlier video, that's the old track. Hold on a sec here. <clears throat> okay. Hey. Uh Guys, I gotta make a couple of calls here. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Do what you do. <laughs> you know, push. Well, yeah. Not lunchtime. Yeah, uh, get busy, go sell. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> 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 what video did you want me to play, Russ? Uh, any of the later ones. You know, that's got all the uh, landscape done. I thought that's what I was. Uh, the one I'm thinking of that I've got right here is 201 707 uh, They don't have number. I'm looking at your page and they're all, they have names, right? So you posted a bunch of videos of, within the last few days. So that's, that's what I can choose from. You're looking on my Facebook page? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you real quick. You didn't even go into the photos if you wanted, Greg. Oh, okay. Just show some of the photos. Sure. Russell, that looked like somebody was doing like an in-car video for a while. Yes, I've done a lot of those. Okay, and that's on uh, 9 by 20 feet. And it's uh, 85 linear feet. Longest line's 87, and the short's 83. In the early stages. <laughs> yeah. Go back the other direction. There we go. Oh, this was pretty early, too. Yeah. It looks like that's about it from your page. Okay. Yeah. And then there's some of those videos should work. So any video you want to play. Yeah. Oh, that's your old place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fight the crowd. I love that bank section. That's so much fun to drive. Yeah, it's fast track. <laughs> Anybody got any questions for Russ about his track? Yeah, does it still exist somewhere? Yeah, I get it out yeah. in the garage. Oh, yeah. that's that's it. right. Okay, I thought there was a new track or something. Though. Yeah, no new, track, uh, new house. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 
I mean, yeah, if anybody has any questions, I mean, I run uh, fidget boards on mine, which have um, switches that can individualize lanes and cut power to each individual lane. And this way we can run fueling, which is a lot of fun. Um, if you were to jump the start, you get a penalty and your car sits there for, you know, whatever determined, predetermined number of seconds. Um, if you don't stop and get fuel, you'll run out and your car will not move the rest of that race, that heat. And, uh, and to refuel, you stop underneath the light bridge and it'll begin to refuel. So there is a lot of strategy to that in how soon to refuel. I mean, it, it all plays a big part and it's a lot of fun. And some of the guys get it figured out pretty quick, you know, whether to run an early pit, pick up fuel and try to go, you know, the rest of the distance or fuel twice and go the full distance. And of course, the faster you drive on a particular lap, it uses more fuel. So it's a lot of fun. It's, I mean, it, it adds another element to the racing, I think. So, is it bi directional, Russell, or do you just run in one direction usually? We just run in one direction. Uh, one direction. I do have switches to make the track. Uh, run the opposite direction or the other direction but um i typically don't i mean everyone has so much fun with that track and that that direction i just leave it you know so and there's a lot of animated things on the track like that oil derrick you seen um you know that derrick actually is a bubbler from an old lionel set you know, back in the 60s, 50s or 60s. So it has a little bubbler that, you know, it has a glass tube and the rig itself has a, uh, an oil pump that moves up and down. Next to that, there's a water tower and it's a bubbler. So it bubbles up and down. And then there's a, uh, there's an air balloon that goes around, you know, and it's just in its own little area. And then there's a kind of a spook house or a haunted house area. And, you know, there's people in there talking and stuff. There's a graveyard. There's a couple of car shows. Um, there's a snack area where, you know, people are hanging out. And, well, it's just an ongoing project. Bad girl. Yeah. Bad girl. One of my favorite features is is when you drive past the grandstands, a bunch of LEDs flash like people taking. Oh pictures. yeah, yeah. That's by a company named Scale Illumination, and man, that is trick. I you, like you said, Greg. I mean, it is really neat. There are LEDs that are probably twice the size of a ballpoint pinpoint, and you can glue them in the hands of Carrera figures or whatever, and they've got really fine wires, so you, they're easily hidden by the person's body. So when you put them where you want them, there's a photo cell that triggers it by the car driving by, and all the grandstands start have you know having it go off. So. It's, I like that too, it is. Well, the, if, you, if you run night races, that must look spectacular. Oh yeah. Well, and I have lighting around the track too. So we don't run a lot of night races, but we could, and it would look awesome, you know? So, yeah. That's wonderful. I, I, love, I love the vignettes, but oh my gosh, if you've got vignettes that are actually animated, that's fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. On my wish list, I've got. A, I want to get a Gatso speed camera, with a with a speed sensor as you go past it. If you're not going fast enough, it doesn't flash. So I think the uh, the trick would be as long as you're going quick enough down the straight, then you get it flashed. 
Yeah. Yep. And we run, we ran our group C uh, series that we ran a while back. We ran probably, it's a 12 week series and we ran, I think, at every, well, everywhere we could, we would run at night, but we would run with the cars would have headlights. There was no, the overall lights were, if they were, if you could dim them, that'd be great. But most of the time we'd run in the complete dark. And that made for some interesting marshalling. So you had to figure out who was where and what, because there were, you couldn't see anything, you know, you couldn't see the car numbers. And God forbid somebody's running the same car, you know, like two Lancias or something like that, and they get put on the wrong lane. But you know, we had that happen a few times, but it was still a lot of fun. It really was uh -huh. racing at night. Even the track you're so, you know, you've been running for years, it's completely different at night. So that was a lot of fun. It's more confusing with digital. We've run a few night races and with digital courses, you, you, you can't um, tell which one is your car because of which lane. So we actually came up with, um, we actually roof mount an LED and each car has got a different color. So it's actually very easy to follow your car around the track because you somebody's got the blue one, somebody's got the red one, somebody's got the orange one, somebody's got the green one. So you actually, uh, you can actually follow the cars, but yeah, it, it does completely change your perception of a track uh, and, and the speeds that you can go around. It is, it is a lot of fun. If you haven't done it, try it. We, we did that once with the roof mounted lights, just like you're describing. The, the problem that some of us had though, is that when the, when the room is dark and the LEDs are lit, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the yellow one and the orange one <laughs> and the blue one and the green one. Even if you're not colorblind, when they're brightly lit, they're not, the colors are so similar that when you're in the heat of battle, it's like, oh, geez. But yeah, that's, that's definitely the way to go. If your room is completely dark, <laughs> you have uh, some you find, There was trouble between, we couldn't find an orange LED at the time. Um, so we actually spray painted uh, uh, and we, we found that actually the, if, you, if you spray paint, the LEDs don't glow quite so bright and the colors more distinct. So you could try that. Because if you've got a red LED, just mist it with a bit of red paint uh, and that that will actually tone the brightness down so you can still, but still see the colour. There you go. Great idea. Sharpie for that as well, Richard, that type of thing. Just use a standard um, white light LED, whatever. And then obviously um, Sharpie do a thousand on different colours. Um, yeah. Just put a little bit of Sharpie on the top and, you know, off you yeah. go. Yeah. To my I would just paint my... Like I said I would just paint my lenses amber. You can get that from, uh, you know, uh, Tamiya Paints. It's a clear paint or Humbrol Paints, you know. So it's all good, guys. And also, I don't know if any of you guys have ever ran my Racer 250 LMs. I sent around the States. It was probably about 10, 12 years ago. They all had uh, headlights and they had overdrive light kits. Uh, they're still, uh, they still work pretty good. Uh, I have there were four of them that I sent around, uh, the Piper body style, the fat body, and they all had NSR tires on it, all in line configuration, and they're all pretty even. Uh, and I had different lights on all those too, uh, you know, all the different color in the headlights, and we did run night races with them. I know the club down in uh, uh, Georgia area, they ran, uh, they did a couple of vids on it. Uh, uh, they ran them too. Uh, in the clubs up in the up in New Hampshire area, they ran them, did a night race, and they put some YouTube vids out on them. Uh, I'm more than welcome to send them around the states again, guys. But it's uh, you know it's old school technology, but they're they're really fun to run. The uh, the little turtles, I call them. Yeah, but, those, uh, I remember running those at um, Fester's Margarita night several years ago. Yeah, 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 and. Uh, you know, Danny's battling uh, a few things right now with his health. But, uh, okay, guys, I got to push this order out. <laughs> I'll right. be back. Hey, Richard and Greg. Yeah. Ray right there. Hey, uh, Ray. Qu quick question. Uh, did either of you put capacitors on your roof-mounted LEDs so it would stay lit in these slots and you could find the cars? Yeah, when the, the ones that were made for the race that I was talking about, they were little electronic things that the, the host had created that were just held to the car with blue tack. So they were self-powered. They had a little button to turn them on and off. So they weren't 
they weren't track powered. So when the car came off, the light was still on. Oh, great. Uh, that would have been good. Yeah, we didn't do that. Uh, I think the problem is finding a capacitor with enough capacity um, to actually run the lights for any length of time. They're, they're actually quite bulky, even if you want your lights to stay on for more, for more than a few seconds. I think um, uh, I found a capacitor that had about the size of maybe three large button cells stacked on top of each other. That kept the two rear lights on my cars on for about five seconds, uh, which might be just about enough. But it, it, yeah, it's, it's tricky. You, you, I think you probably almost need a, a tiny rechargeable battery. I don't know than... how they do it these days, but some of the commercial light kits already have that. That uh, I mean, I've got I've got one that I bought I think off a of slot car corner uh, on a car that I prepared for a, for the 24 hour in Michigan a couple of years back, and those lights stay on for a couple of minutes after you take the car off the track. Uh, and there are ones coming out of Europe these days that when the car de-slots, then the lights flash. It, it probably yeah. has, has a rechargeable battery. Z machine do those. Z machine, that's the one. Yeah, Z machine. Yeah, that's yeah. what I run too. Z I need to look at those. Z machine. Yeah. 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 Or, or for you, you Richard, Z machine. Right? Yeah. 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 I can translate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you were talking about a Datsun 240Z earlier on, I thought, what's he talking about? Oh, it's a 240Z. Okay. Well, you'd know it as a fair lady, presumably. Uh, in South Africa, no, we had the we had the the. Um, the America, the, 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 the Z designations. Right. In fact, in South Africa, the 240Z was always called a 24 ounce because, of the, because of the OZ at the end. <laughs> That's like a senior dose for the uh, Mr. Two. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, Lloyd's got something. Yeah, yeah. The, um, these little Volkswagen here and several other cars that uh, Peter has sent over from Austria. If this comes off the track, the, the lights stay on for a very long time. Um, and these are very small cars, but uh, nearly all of his cars, except for the Mini, has got these light systems in them and they... Uh, uh, if the car stopped right up the other end of the track, by the time I've walked up, the, the lights are still on. So I'm not sure what system they're using, but they seem to work all right. It, was that one of your cars, John? Uh, it's, well, it's one of my teammates. Um, is, um, it's a... Um, obviously Ford GT, um, but that's a homemade light kit in it. So um, basically it's um, a slotted um, light and chip, um, obviously with a load of modifications. Um, we've had a lot of problems with capacitors over the years running it, um, doing the disc stuff, whether it's w, um, WEC or GT3. And um, now Adam's sort of got to the stage where he's... Um, he thinks he's sorted it out. Lucky enough, his dad's a um, electrical engineer, so he's, he's been giving him a hand. But I know he is possibly looking at um, doing like kits and going through something like Facebook, possibly on the forum. Um, obviously, front, rear lights, brake lights, and then obviously flashing lights. You can do police cars, you can do um, pickup trucks such as uh, Richard's um, tow truck, um, and the flashing lights, you know. Um, but as I say, the light kits are, are good. It's when you have a problem with them, then they're such fine wires. I try and find a couple of other pictures um, of the, the inside of the wiring for you, so you can have a look. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I say, um, it adds a different concept. Um, it's in the dark. You know, we, we do it at, um, we used to do it at Rockingham on a regular basis. Um, we used to do a team race with group C's, standard group C's, um, and you'd pair up. Um, the best racer with the slowest racer, second best, second worst, probably pair up into teams and race between 10 and 20, 10 to 20 minutes each over the four lanes. So you've got to get two, two runs, one on the outer lane and one on the inner lane. And then obviously after the hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever it was, I'll be in the most stuff you should win. But, um, 
it used to be quite popular, but for some reason we seem to sort of tailed off and then we sort of restructured our um, classes last year. Um, because we were going to drop the dinner. So, um, so but, you know, it, it's, um, it was quite good. At, you know, I did it with a couple of people where they're not so quick and you sort of grab hold of their car and take it to bits and, you know, get your wrenches out and tweak it, tweak it a little bit. And you can gain between a couple of tenths to a, possibly up to a second a lap. You know, um, normally the biggest thing was the fact that, you know, um, it wasn't normally set up properly, but then, you know, based on wood, the biggest thing is obviously the, um, the rubber, rubbery things that push it down the track. So, um, so I'll that, see if it, I'll put the that, that, by the rack car. I'm sure I've got some pictures on there somewhere, but it's just a question of um, the trouble is I'm a bit lazy. And I should all, I should label all my pictures really. Um, now, now, Lloyd, uh, do, do you run your um, rallies uh, in the dark as well? Is that why you, you have lighting kits for your cars? No, uh, that would be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't got to that stage, but uh, I could blank off the windows and see what happened. But uh, uh, it, it's scary enough in the light, so uh, it would be very interesting to try and the dark. So, so that entry that you got, that chap put that lighting kit in, not even as a requirement for your rules. He just did it. No, no, to do it. He puts them in nearly all of his cars, but. Uh, in fact, the Mini did have them last year, but the, this time he's modified the Mini and um, put so many other stuff in there that he didn't have room for the light kit this time. But uh, he puts lights in nearly all of his cars, including the ready-to-run ones and just something they do. But I've seen the board that they use, and to me, who does not... Um, I'm not very good at circuitry like that. They look very complicated. There you go, John. That's the inside of a, um, a disc of a WEC Lola. Um, oh. As well, MP2. Um, you can see the socket chip up there um, with yeah. the um, core sensor. Then, obviously, if you look at the body, um, the chip for the lighting is connected into that. And then, um, if you look where the motor is, you'll see there's a red and white, uh, sorry, red and black. Uh, yeah. coming off the uh, motor terminals and there's a little uh, just a simple little um, block connector so obviously you can whip the body off you just pull out the connector and then obviously just make sure red to red black to black if you want to reconnect it but um so that's a slotted lola on a srp chassis i believe um which is obviously a 3d printed chassis from spain but um john perhaps about my teammate in the xl team uh that's it as a LMP2. Sometimes um, he has run it as a LMP1. She just puts an angle winder um, pod in it and she jobs a um, 20k um, flat sits in it and off you go. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I think all up. I think that's just on the weight limit. I think that's 79 grams all up now. Uh -oh. Very as cool. I say, it, it's um, digital isn't for everyone. Um, I like it because it's an added, um, the added bonus of also changing lanes. Um, you know, all the tracks that we run the disc on are all sort of very large tracks. Um, obviously, you've all seen the Henley one. You know, I think that's an average lap round is about fifteen seconds. But um, you know, some of the smaller tracks are still eight, ten second laps. So um, it's just a different concept. Um, it's changing lanes, you know, obviously that's all Richard does, I believe, is um, you just do um, SSD all the time, Richard, don't you? Don't do analog at all, don't you? Apart from yeah, digital only um, with the occasional rally track. Yeah, yeah. As I say, you know, stock racing, stock racing, you know, I've got um, one of my mates, Sean, he um, often comes in here sometimes. We are racing, you know, um, all the time, obviously you know um might build in the things you know it's, you know before at the moment the scratch build um i think the best one since the lockdown started is the um the south Emperor, um, or the Emperor, the time start um, 
Some of the mitos, was it mitos? Did um, three different sorts of tie. They did a black, a grey, and a blue. Oh. And they sold it with a die. And the idea was was to throw the die and say, um, let's see whether it was um, a, obviously snowing, icy, or wet, or choke. I think it, no, it, it was rain, dry rain, or snow. Um, the black ties were obviously for um, standard track um, standard tires. The grey could rain, the blue were a really hard, um, as if it was sort of snowing. And the idea was to roll the dice. I took it to Oxford and we did it. Um, I basically set up three um, fly racing M1s and um, had the three different cars, all the same gear and same motors, etc., but with the three different wheels on. And we rolled the dice, and it was a question of doing five laps of each car on whatever lane. So just something different. What you got there, Leo? Yeah. <coughs> This is a Formula One car. Um, yeah, can you see it okay? And um, I fitted this and some others with um, what I wanted to, to simulate was a, a rain light. Um, you know, it's used in F1 cars. Um, so, so it's an LED which is driven by an integrated circuit chip which is driven by a, a watch battery. So it's a very small EG4 sized battery. Uh, it's about sort of that sort of, um, well, about five millimeter diameter. Mm -hmm. And um, that's housed easily within inside the car, which drives the chip, and the chip um, drives the LED uh, at the, a rate I can decide something. Um, so of course it also covers uh, as a um, harvesting light um, in the hybrid era for Formula One cars. And I fit a little switch at the side so you can control it. Obviously, it's not powered by the track, as you can see. It's powered entirely by a little battery, uh, and I fit a little switch at the back which switches it on or off manually. Um, obviously, when it's raining or not. That, that was fairly easy to do. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll share the circuit. Um, the tip it uses is an LM3909, um, which can be found on eBay. And um, you just need a, sort of a watch battery, a holder for the watch battery, obviously, and a capacitor. Um, the capacitor decides the uh, flash rate. Um, the capacitor is quite small, so it's easy to fit inside the car. Cool. Next, you'll have radio transmissions from Sebastian Vettel complaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but it won't be a red car by then, of course. You'll be driving a different color of car, presumably, or maybe not driving. Right, 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 guys. Sorry, I've got to go. Enjoy the rest of your meeting, and I'll um, I'll catch up on um, YouTube in the next day or two. Hey, Bye, John. Hey Russ. Hey Greg. Is uh is love still on here? I uh, don't think so. Yeah, it, I don't think so either. He, he left. Um, no, he, yeah, he he had to leave. Sorry. Okay. My question is about copper tape on our track, on a uh, wood routed track. Do we What's have question? maybe somebody here can help? Well, the question is. I recently seen a video where people are using that do use copper tape are using about one mil. I think Love uses one mil. Now, when I built my track, I used five and I used the five mil because I wanted to make sure that the tape was good and strong. But I noticed that in his video, he talks about with one mil tape, it's so thin. You don't have to worry about the tires dragging across the tape. Now, I don't think I've had a problem. Nobody said anything, but. I don't think it's a performance of the car so much because I never noticed any issues racing on your track regarding 
catching on the tape. Uh, but I think his his commentary was that the five mil <clears throat> was so tall that the car's tires hitting the side of the tape would eventually pull up the tape and damage the tape. Have you noticed any tape damage? Not really. There's one spot that may be, but you know, it's not bad. Not bad enough to think, you know, worry about. Now, if I was going to replace that tape, if I wanted to retape the whole track, when you pull up the old, is there anything you can think of that needs to be done? Just pull it up, or I mean, do you need to clean it, reroute it, not reroute it, but resand it? Do you have any idea? Can you use Gugon maybe? Or? I think as long as there's nothing preventing the adhesive on the new tape from working, old adhesive being stuck down shouldn't really affect the new adhesive from working. I mean, if the old adhesive doesn't want to come up, that's just more adhesive to help right. hold down the, the new tape. Problem um, is going to be you're going to get some bumps along there if you don't. Yeah, if it's really it's thick such, adhesive, yeah. yeah. So I would take it up. I would use some, maybe some lighter fluid or something like that, um, or naphtha or something, just to clean the clean all of the all of the old glue off. I, uh, I think didn't didn't but, David Renicky just do that to his track because he yeah, was, I was hoping he would not. <laughs> yeah. He would yeah. definitely be able to answer that. I mean, quite honestly, if if I was pulling up copper tape, I would be pulling it up so that I could reroute and put braid down. Yeah. But that's that's just me. I was gonna say, yeah. Russ, don't pull up the tape just to switch to one mill for some reason. Wait until you have to. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Just thought. Yeah, I, I'm, I don't remember him saying that it was it was a concern, other than the cars causing it to become damaged because it's that much taller for the wheels to kind of yeah and there there's a way to get around that too i mean if you mm. if you if you are having that then then mask off the mask off the um the copper tape leaving like a sixteenth of an inch or so on the on the side away from the slot and then give it a spray of clear or something like that so that you actually have a, a like a paint layer that's going from the track onto the edge of the tape and that's that, good would, idea. that would yeah. allow the, the tire to transition across that without pulling the tape up okay we're doing that earlier but it's really only if you have this massive issue with with the tape coming up uh, no. yeah no i appreciate that and i don't but um but that is a good solution now you said the only reason would be to put braid down <laughs> that's why? usually why people pull up tape if the tape isn't damaged then the only yeah, other reason right. to pull up the tape is to switch to braid yeah well well what i'm thinking is right i've had it copper taped for a couple of years no problems why what's the benefit of me going to braid if you haven't had problems with it russell then i wouldn't do it but you know some some folk have problems with braid if you're in an area where, for example, the track sees a lot of temperature change, uh, or a oh. lot of hum or a lot of humidity change, I know the guys down in Florida like the, you know, in the summer it'll be a hundred degrees and a hundred percent, in the winter it'll be a hundred degrees and zero percent. So they, you know, they might get a lot of humidity change, and that swells the wood or it changes the track, and they get cracks or they get little bumps and so on. Um, so, you know, big, big temperature range changes and big uh, humidity changes will affect the track a lot more. If you're in a more stable environment, then the copper tape works fine. Uh, yeah. You know, my track, for instance, stands on the patio outside behind my garage. So, you know, in the winter, it's down at 40 degrees. In the summer, it's like today, it's probably at 100 degrees out there. And if it was, if it was copper tape, I would be forever reburnishing more. Or fixing, but with the braid, it, it handles that no problem. And just like just like your 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 braids on your car, it can stretch and mm -hmm. compress mm -hmm. because it's braided, and so it can yeah. handle all that contraction. It can handle all that, that expansion, yeah. And right. it's it's a lot stronger and a lot thicker, right? You get much better. Eventually, you get much better power 
delivery as well, although with our cars uh, on home tracks, it's not really a big deal. You know, yeah. on a commercial track, it's a different story. Uh, the other benefit is that you could uh, put in magna braid if you wanted to be able to. Yes, if magna you wanted to. Yeah, well, the magna braid's expensive. Yeah, like three or four times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Pat went with magna braid on his reconstruction of, of Tim's old track. Yeah, that's what I understand. So. Yeah, yeah we got a couple of tracks down here in Southern California that have magna braid as well. Does yeah. magna braid rust? Obviously, it's got. It must have steel content. It has a steel core, Richard, and then it's copper, pra copper plated on the outside of the steel core and then tinned. So no, it doesn't rust. Right. There can't be a huge amount of magnetic attraction then. Not the oh. same as a, not the same as you would get on a on a Scaly or a Carrera track. No, but enough. Yeah, it's a little less than a Carrera track because yeah. uh, yeah. it's it's steel, not stainless steel, but it's not a lot. So when I've had problems, I know what you're talking about. I'm up in the Pacific Northwest, just north of you. Um, I understand with the temperature change. Um, I don't have a lot because I'm in my garage, but it will get as low as 40 in there in dead cold and as hot as 78. No. Yeah, okay. Now what I do when I have, I haven't had it pull apart anywhere yet, but I do get it where it, when it grows, you'll get a little bump here and there. Now I stay on top of it and burnish it, you know, with a lighter, with their whatever. And um, it seems to be fine. So in fact, I think my, <laughs> my routing is, <laughs> is rougher than the tape I, I mean your tape your your every time I've been to your track it's been wonderful so you know obviously you're maintaining it very well I appreciate it Greg yeah. you guys realize that 40 degrees Fahrenheit in Canada is shorts weather right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Just saying. We, we love Just our saying. temperate climate here in the Pacific Northwest it yes. never gets too cold and never gets too hot well, at least nope. not so recently. <laughs> yep. Sorry about you down in Southern California. <laughs> Sucks yeah. to be you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I've been well, there. <laughs> it's pretty warm. It's been pretty warm this week. It's um, it's been. I think yesterday was like ninety six or ninety seven. Yeah. Uh, but I've seen one hundred and four outside on my patio and had to call everybody and say, "Listen, we're not racing today." Because there's, there's I, I no lived, ways anybody will survive that heat. Uh, I lived over in uh, Redlands, and I mm -hmm. used to do a lot of off-road racing out there. Oh, yeah. That's even hotter than where I am. Oh, yeah. 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 So I was going to say, yours sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah. No problem on 112-degree days. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, thanks, guys. I'm in the middle of my two weeks vacation, and then we've had nothing but rain and thunderstorms, and it's all just for goodness sake. I was going to yeah. say, it looks pretty windy where you're at. It's windy, it's wet, we, are, we have thunderstorms. We've never normally had thunderstorms for more than one day, but we've had about four or five consecutive days of thunderstorms. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, yeah it, there is the odd occasion, there is a little bit of flash of sunshine uh, every now and again. Yeah, every couple of days we get about 10, 15 minutes of it, but... Uh, yeah, the uh, the weather is horrendous. Yeah. But I'm getting a lot, of, a lot of time to spend um, uh, in my uh, man cave doing slot car stuff, so it's, it's all good. So, boy. Yeah, uh, we were talking about a couple. Oh, got to say hi. Hi, oh. mate. <laughs> what were you saying, Lloyd? Uh, yeah, um, we are talking about the copper tape and affected by weather. Uh, my shed is halfway down the garden. It's not insulated, and although our weather is not as extreme as yours, it gets quite cold. And at the moment, we've been having temperatures uh, equivalent to high 80s in the shed. And um, normally, you know, all these little cars going around my little Monty track, the um, the one that can't get round, so I've been um, trying to improve the track to let it go around, is the Mini. And um, 
few days ago, I brought these cars to the shed for the first time for a while and give them all a run round and uh, to just see how they were going and put the Mini on and it absolutely flew around. And usually on in very hot temperatures in the shed, the track isn't very good at all. But I've discovered that this particular little Mini loves hot weather. Yeah, temperature absolutely affects traction. I mean, when, when we have yeah. races on our electric track during the winter in the track, you know, in my garage, for example, in the winter, you know, it's it's cold, you know, it's it's low 50s in the garage, cold for us. Uh, there's no traction. So, you know, I've got to crank up the heater, you know, put a, a heater out in the garage just to get the ambient temperature warm enough so that the cars start to get traction. You know, I'm sure the the how warm the actual tire is has a has a pretty noticeable effect as well as the temperature of the track. So yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I I was I was like waiting for you to say how much better the Mini is driving in the hot weather. Yeah, it, it's amazing because it's little tiny wheels that go around at a tremendous rate all the time. It's it's whizzing around. But normally speaking, on very hot weather, we find uh, the track a little bit. Uh, unpredictable but as I say at the moment with this constant warm weather in there it's actually improved quite a lot. While, while I'm here um, two surprising little visitors arrived I don't know whether you can see these properly but they are British Ford Zodiacs or Zephyrs cool. from the early 1960s but what was surprising about them is they were built and uh, sent here from Indianapolis um, the so, no, of, was it at least an, an expat who sent them who actually knows of the cars or well, well his name is Cameron Wright I don't know with that name possibly he was from Scotland or something at some time but um, the um, he picked out he wanted a Ford uh, obviously he's a Ford man he wanted a, a British Ford so he picked out this got the die cast, made resins from it, and here we have the little Ford Zephyrs. But when I, when I saw the builds he was doing on the forums, it, I, didn't, I had no idea that he wasn't um, from Britain. So that was quite a surprise, and they, they run well as well. Wow, that's really cool. What kind of chassis did he put under him? They appear to be 3D printed. There you go. Okay, yeah. um, these, these bits here are lead because I said they needed to be 50 to 60 grams. So he's put some lead in there. But I think these are 3D printed chassis, but I cannot be absolutely certain about that. I mean, if it's... If it's uh filament printed then you'd be able to see little lines so. yeah i don't i don't know what they're made of um they they feel plasticky um, maybe they're even resin i don't know I, I haven't took the body off to have a look yet yeah they have machined them out of some delrin or something like that too by the looks of yeah. lots of possible yeah. yeah there's some good work on there the um the castings front and rear look a little rougher, so maybe they um, were 3D printed. I would say that the guide is, so I, I would think he's done quite a lot of 3D in that one. Cool, cool. Well, that's quite a cool car to, uh, to build, yeah. Yeah, unusual choice for an American. <laughs> I guess it's... I like, I like unique. Sorry? I like unique. Uh, yeah, I, if you look at my choice of resin cars, the uh, bodies there, uh, um, I like to build what other people don't. Mm. So have you, have you done a Trabant yet? <laughs> have I done which? A Trabant. Uh, no, uh, the reason I haven't done the Trabant, I've got the uh, die cast here, but um, Roland Kohl, I think it is, in uh, Germany, has done a Trabant. 
but because um, of some problems uh, with the family business, he hasn't been able to finish it yet, but the Trabant was supposed to be coming to this proxy. It may get here yet. Well, the only one I can uh, I can think of that you might not have is a Bond bug, and you'd only need two wheels because the guide would be the third wheel. I haven't got a Bond bug, but I've got uh, Reliant Regal Vans. There you go. Close enough. Pendles make a Bond bug, don't they? I think yeah, they've been recently think released. So. It. They're easy to do. You don't need a front wheel. Yeah, right. you just need a guide. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, this, and, and somewhere you have to put Mr. Bean on the track, I imagine. Yeah. I'm sure, uh, I'm pretty certain that somewhere on Slot Forum I saw that somebody's done a Mr. Bean recently <laughs> with him sitting on the roof. Right. All right, guys, I got to leave you all. Got to work That's called. <laughs> Catch up next time, eh? See ya. Stay safe. I have a, a hey, little uh, guys. Lloyd, I think uh, Corgi, Corgi did a, a Mr. Bean there uh, die cast, but it's uh, we're waiting to get them in here in the U.S. Several die cast, 43rd scale, I think they are, the die cast cars. But, uh, you know, Hornby, Skelly, we're doing uh, some of those, you know, guys that uh, as far as uh, – Overseas, you know, the, the three-wheeler, you know, it's off of that one series, I forget the name of it, that was done in Britain, in the UK, back in the day. But uh, a little bit about myself, I do work for Hornby USA, guys, all right, I'm a sales rep for them and whatnot. Uh, if you don't know, if you haven't heard me or whatnot, I go at AJK on the forums. Uh, you don't post that much anymore, I go with Tony K once in a while on uh, Home Racing World, but... Uh, you know, so busy uh, uh, working now, I don't have time to get on the forums as much as I used to. So, And uh, I do proxy races, not as much as I used to. But, uh, yeah, it's a good job to have. I used to be with a company in Tacoma called Fantasy World. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, some of my old customers are on here uh, uh, from back in the day. But uh, yeah. I have a good day, guys. Uh, i got to submit another order. I'll be back. <laughs> Okay, and I was one of Fantasy World's customers way back when. Yeah, John. Uh, you know, uh, the owner of Fantasy World right now, Dave, uh, you know, Dave basically uh, retired after 35 years, you know, four or five years ago. Uh, now, believe it or not, he's uh, flipping houses, and he's uh, doing a very good job at it uh, so out he, here in the Northwest. Uh, wow, so, so he went full scale and did well. There you go. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, what happens, uh, you know, uh, you know, with basically with any kind of uh, 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 real estate and whatnot around here, especially if you have, uh, you know, he had a big, uh, big facility where he had his RC racing outdoors. He had a, we had a, uh, you know, pavement track that would set up and a pipe track as far as RC. And then we had a, there was a large uh, layout in the warehouse that we had there. Now it, uh, it belongs to one of the other clubs there in the States in, in the Tacoma area. Uh, Greg runs on it quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a good, it was a fun, uh, fun place to work for. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, things happen, uh, the landlords, as far as, uh, as far as leasing around here, I've had a few accounts close up because they jacked the lease so far up on these businesses that they can't recover from it. And then they, next thing you know, they retire, uh, you know, and it's sad to see a lot of the hobby shops around this area. Uh, re, you know, the guys are retiring, uh, you know, uh, and, and going out of business. Um, you know, luckily there's a, you know, I just closed a big account up in Linwood last year. Uh, he's been in business for almost 20 some 30 years. Uh, Galaxy hobbies. Uh, a few of you know it, uh, Greg, you've probably been there. I don't, you know, and, uh, it was a great account. And it's sad to see because these realtors and and, uh, and uh, people that own the properties are just greedy these days. You know, it's tough for the hobbyist. Is Red Devil still? Well, guys, good day. Yep, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've only been in the hobby for, you know, like I said, 10 years in the area and 
even I've seen places closed that have been around for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Yeah, Red Devil's no longer around, Greg. Yeah, I didn't think so. That's that's sad. Yeah. Uh, Red Devil. Although the good, if, there is, if, there, if there is some good news with what's going on, I know that uh, like model kit builders and hobbies in general, a, a lot of stores, especially local to us, are like their business is up by 40% over last year. That That's what I'm noticing. The online business is going crazy. I mean, but it's amazing how many more i just did my own facebook slot car page but it's amazing how many more hits you're getting now because of the covid people at the house not doing anything i mean so quite honestly it's like it was when i was growing up almost you know i mean well, yeah and and, 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 and. To your, to your point russell i'm sure there are a lot of people who are tidying things up and going hey i remember this Let's see if it works. Yeah. It starts. Yeah. 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 Our hobby shop is doing really well. It's one of the, it's, it's, I think probably the biggest one in Denver. It's, it does everything from plastic kits to RC. And then they've got a basement downstairs. that's just as big as the storefront upstairs. And it, it holds our slot car track. And then there's room for guys that run mini Z's. And then there's also room for uh, guys that, with scalers that do rock crawling. And they hold swap meets occasionally, and uh, the prices are pretty good. But uh, yeah, it's it's good to at least have that one around, though they are dying, as you guys said. I think people were we are rediscovering their old hobbies because of lockdown. Um, the only reason the tow truck came about was because we were having a Zoom chat at the club because we obviously weren't meeting as a club, and somebody got talking about their old favourite Hot Wheels cars and whatever, and suddenly the penny dropped. And I think um, I actually I actually started doing. Um, if, if you look at my Route One Racing YouTube channel, you'll find that there's some some lockdown racing championship. I built a little um, uh, Hot Wheels track. Uh, that's wide enough for three cars to pass each other and did some races and videoed them just, you know, and get, uh, assigned each of the guys in the club a, a car that I drew from a black uh, a black bag. And we had the races and it was totally, um, uh, totally random who won it. But I, I, I guess we just re, we started rediscovering, you know, finding other ways to amuse ourselves. So yeah, I, I totally get how people are rediscovering their airfix models and the push towards mental health and mindfulness. You know, there's nothing more relaxing than putting an airfix model together. Well, well there, there's also a lot, Richard, to your point, there's a lot of satisfaction in actually making something. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there, there, there's a generation that hasn't really hasn't experienced that. It's something to do it on a screen. It's different when you can actually pick it up in your hand and actually use it. Oh, yeah. It's getting people to, to, to realize that and suddenly they realize that if you come off your Xbox just for a few milliseconds, there's actually a world out there. And yeah, I find because my, my, um, my uh, normal occupation is quite, uh, is quite brain based. Uh, so I don't actually make anything. I teach, I teach people. Uh, I, co I coach people. So that's, that's, you know, I don't have anything physical to show at the end of the day. That's why I like making stuff. Cause at least when I came out into the man cave and produced something, I've got something physical to show for my efforts. And then I quite like but that. You're also, but you're also a perfect example of the melding of the two with 3d printing where yeah. you can use a digital medium and produce something physical. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I think the problem with youngsters is they don't realize they've got those options. Yeah, they don't even know how to stick up a shelf or wire an electrical plug, all those basics that we know. Use a uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pay somebody to do it, which I find um, as astonishing. That's why, that's why plumbers are making as much as some physicians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see if you can find one and get them to turn out. Yeah, well, how, how many heart surgeons can fix their toilet? <laughs> oh, they just pay somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I have a little something to share. Yeah, you, um, this Lloyd, you're like this, uh, talking about the Trabant and something. If I, if I, uh, if I may share, can you see my screen? Can you see uh, the? Um, can you see the Waltzberg? Yep. So that's uh, that's a scale. That's a scale drawing that I found off the internet. And Andy Pinchcock, who's joined us a few times on this chat asked me if I'd be willing to help him out making uh, making a Waltzberg. 
So yeah. what I've been doing, you can see by me moving this stuff, I've actually been tracing um, the outline uh, <laughs> of the Wartburg. So uh, that's going to be the next step is, um, is to, once I've got the shape, uh, I basically create a negative of that and use that to carve a block. So I shall be doing that for all, all, four, all four views, creating an outline shape and carving a block um, to, to form the Wartburg. Fortunately, it's fairly square, so it should be fairly straightforward to do. But he's got a series in Germany that he's wanting to run, and they all they 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 all want um, they all want a Wartburg. So it's um, he's he's contacted me multiple times over the last you know couple of years of me you know talking about three D printing. You know, like when I first started getting into three D printing, he's like, "Oh, can can you find a Wartburg model? Can you print me a Wartburg?" And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Let's look. And we we would both of us spent hours and hours looking for a printable. Wartburg model and I just I could never find a good one. There, there are models different. there are models out there and some of them are quite expensive. I found one they wanted something like ninety nine dollars for it. The okay. problem is I think they're designed for games yeah. rather than printing and so they're they're not actually stitched together properly and you couldn't print them. But it's just because they're gonna be racing these it doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's um it's near enough. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna hybrid it. I am gonna make as close a model as I can three D printed. But then we'll finish it by hand, get it nicely sorted, and he's got a guy who's going to um, make a mould and slush cast them out of resin, uh, which uh, which will probably be the best way forward. I'll probably do a three. I'll do a, 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 a three D printed chassis for it, a variation on the chassis that I've got for um, for the tow truck and the milk float, uh, which will be be tunable. I'm even thinking of building a DPR hatch into it because um he's talking about running it on carrera digital because you've got the um there's a carrera digital chip that fits into a dpr hatch yep. and it will also mean that i don't have to buy quite so many chips i can actually start moving them around <laughs> this is my my modeling passion is costing me a fortune in digital chips uh yeah you know, i really ought to i really ought to engineer a dpr hatch into my chassis i think yeah that's definitely a nice that's really cool. So, how, how how much time did it take you to get this far, Richard? Uh, what well, with that, um, that uh, it doesn't take much to trace it because uh, I used I use a, a a program called Corel Draw, which is so uh, it's very easy to draw lines and then bend them to to, to suit. Um, yeah, it's hard to do because because the because the model is fairly square. Uh, I think I'll, it'll probably take me about. It'll probably take me about 20 hours to get the beast to a point where I'm happy, which isn't too bad. I mean, this is something that's going to stretch well into the autumn. Uh, but uh, I think um, I'm already thinking of variations because it, it's, it's not so much drawing the shape and carving. It's figuring out how to print it because you don't want to print uh, with too many supports in place because you can't print something unless there's something underneath it to print on the way the printer works so i think i'm going to have to make the the hood and the trunk lid separate and the roof separate items that have to drop on so you need to think about how you're going to construct it like an airfix model well so, or uh, i mean here's here's a really dumb idea what if you printed it upside down um i could you could print it upside down but you still need supports for the um for the for the hood and the trunk lid the other way up because there's obviously a gap so I think if I if I print the thing, uh, I may very well print it um, upside down uh, with the roof in place. But I, if I do a variation of the of the of the trunk lid and the roof, then then some of the Wartburgs had sunroofs, so there'll be uh, there'll be a variation with and without. Mm -hmm. Some of them had a uh, had a boot lid spoiler, so I can print the, uh, the 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 trunk with and without the spoiler. Uh, I might make the front nose section. Um, uh, the whole front grille and bumper are separate unit because some of them that they race has got a splitter on the front, so there's no there's no fender, but there's a there's a splitter um, uh, that drops down on the nose. So the, the beauty of with I guess with 3D is that um, is that you can have a production run of one. Right. Uh, well, the the other the other thing to consider too, because we did this, I, I was at a, an event for Honda when the new Civic was released, and they were doing 3D prints of the new car. And what they did was they printed like half of it, like the, the rear half and then the front half, and then someone just basically glued it together. But 
yeah. I imagine if you slice it along, you know, wherever you need to along along yeah. its uh, length, perhaps that's another solution. I don't know. I, it could I'm be the two side panels could be printed laying down on their side, uh, uh, and uh, and then bridge the gap uh, with with bulkheads and you know. So uh, I need to what I need to do is beauty is I build the model first and then figure out how to chop it up. Because once you've okay. built the model, you can have an infinite number of copies of them and you can chop it every, any way you like until you get something that works. And Richard, when you, when you say build the model or when you say carve it, are you doing that uh, in the 3D, in the, in the software? Or are you doing it yes. physically? Yes, no, no, in, in, in the software. Uh, so okay. that, shape, that shape that I drew, <coughs> yeah. what I'll do is I'll then create a very large rectangle to go around it and yeah. remove that shape from the rectangle. Oh, so I see. Okay, so that's your carving, right? Yeah, then, then, okay. I, then I extrude that, and I use that to remove uh, all the material from the block. Uh, okay. it. So I it's, it's almost working in negative space. And if you do that from two different angles, you get a very close approximation of the final shape. Wow. Okay. Uh, and it's almost you need to make something in the negative, so you remove... You know, as I said the other week, I think, um, is it Michelangelo, when he was asked, how did you carve David? He said, in that block of marble, David was always there. I just took away the bits that weren't David. Yep. And so that's what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to take away the bits that aren't Wartburg. Cool. So, you're, so you'll build the, you'll complete, you'll do the model of the body of the car as, as well as you possibly can. Yep. <clears throat> and then figure out the best way to, to, to 3D print it. But you yeah. do... I, I know you're already aware of Area 71 and and you know their their bodies that they do and of course yep. Shapeways their, their printing technology is self-supporting so you could totally have that body printed you yep. know by Shapeways with no supports whatsoever not having to split it up into pieces and stuff like that uh, and if, it's gonna be, if it's then going to be cast and then copied with resin yeah. I mean, that might be the way to go. That'll be Andy's call because I'm not paying to have that shell printed at Shapeways. I know that. <laughs> you're, yeah. probably looking about a, you're probably looking at least $100 to have it printed in one thirty second. He also wants it in one twenty fourth. So I said, you know, at the end of the day, I said, look, if I provide, provide the files, then it's easy enough to scale it up to one twenty fourth. You can't scale the chassis up, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, he probably will put a play fit chassis underneath it on 124, so he just needs the body for that. But yeah, if he wants to print it as a single piece, then then you know he can have the file to do that. But I'll let him pick up the tab from Shapeways. Shapeways. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Richard, um, how, how smooth are your bodies turning out? Um, they 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 need priming and sanding. Um, I'm only just beginning to experiment with um, some of the the settings on my um, uh, on my um, printer. The problem is the, the tow track isn't a brilliant finish, but I was impatient to see the thing printed. The body, as it was, took ten hours to print. If I printed in super high resolution, it'd probably be more like thirty. Uh, but I think uh, um, with the next print, I probably will bite the bullet. Uh, and get it going but um yeah the, the finer resolution the smoother finish you want um the more you have to the more time it takes yeah. but i may look at abs the what people do with a with the abs plastic is you can actually um fog it afterwards with acetones if you if you hit it with vaporized acetone it actually slightly slightly melts the surface and makes it um makes just the surface go liquid and go very smooth and glossy Mm -hmm. so that, that might be worth thinking about but it's i also experimented on my on the pla which is far nicer to print with i actually experimented just brushing it with pva glue no wood glue mm -hmm. and then just sanding it down and that actually gave quite a smooth finish so i think i need to experiment a little bit but yeah i think patience and uh and a decent thick primer uh and uh, you can get a reasonable finish but no the the, the um Cheap printers don't do great quality. Yeah, I, I, I love the selection that Area Seventy One has, but the just the finish or that you put up with it is just it's a turn off for me. Yeah, I, I think know. if they were to print with a resin printer with the SL, with the, with the SLA, they'd probably get a much better quality finish. Mm. Uh, but as I understand it, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think I think the liquid resin printers, the material is actually quite expensive. And it needs support structure. Yeah. 
Okay, Dennis, you, you did an Area 71 body recently, didn't you? I did two recently, yeah. yeah. And, and how did you uh, find it? <laughs> rough. Yeah. Uh, oh. what, I, what I discovered on the second one, the, the, the first one, um, uh, it, didn't, it didn't work so well. What I discovered on the second one was to be, uh, if certainly for the first sanding, to be much more aggressive than you would expect. Uh, I mean, I, I wet sanded with 320 grit uh, wet paper uh, on the second one. And that, uh, you, you know, you've got to be a little careful about the detail, but it certainly, it certainly cut the amount of time that was needed to, to get a reasonable finish by the time I was done. Um, so, yeah, as, as Mark said, it, they, they're very, very nice bodies. They're beautifully light. Uh, but yeah, it's it takes some time to get them done. Uh, you know, I'll do another one soon, but uh, right now I've had enough for the, for, for the next little while. I think that uh, a, a filament-based printer printing at its highest highest quality, you know, printing capability would be just as, if not slightly easier to post to the post processing than the technology that's used by area 71 for theirs but there that's the sls technology the the resin powder that i was talking uh, about earlier and it's it's no matter what no matter how awesome that technology is it's going to have that mottled kind of pockmarky surface yeah. and with the with the filament printer you're going to have layers but the really high resolution printing the layers are really 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 thin you know we're talking about 0 0.05 millimeters some go even thinner than that and so a lot of times just just one coat and sanding of you know a primer is enough and in some cases if you if you're not a stickler you don't even feel like doing that what do you got there mark uh so a uh, 124th scale aston martin dbr1 which is you know i've been threatening to send this to dennis for a few years now but uh <laughs> it's got some I guess that we're talking about the supports is those cross beams and stuff that are in there. Yeah. I mean, it's white. It's not showing up very well. But the shape is beautiful. But it's just, you know, you just look at the finish and you go, do I really want to do this? But what kind of what kind of print is that? Do you know? I, I don't know. I, I bought this online a, a few years ago. Does it have layers? Pardon? Does it have layers or does it have that kind of sandy surface? Uh, it has a sandy surface. Okay. But yeah, so those braces are just there to make sure it doesn't deform before you get to building on it. Yeah, it's just they put them at, they're in the craziest spot where it looks like you'll lose engine, you'll lose body detail if you take, get rid of them all. But, you know, a project for another day. I mean, I get some stuff off of Shapeways that is just smooth as a baby's bottom is, but I, I don't know, I guess I'm just, Wondering why everybody else doesn't do that, but I guess that question was answered earlier. It's just Shapeways gives you an option to pay to, to pay for it to be polished. Yeah, uh, and uh, if you have it polished, then I think they 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 sandblast it with aluminium oxide. Okay, which gives it a smooth. It's not a perfectly smooth finish, but it is less um, sandy to the feel. Yeah. and the, the price the price between rough and polished is is negligible. Yeah. I mean, to me, I mean, it's you know, it's a few bucks, but yeah, yeah it's. Okay, so I didn't know that that was a process beyond printing. I just thought they threw it on another printer or something. Yeah, there's a there's I mean, a try that sometimes when you when you purchase the model from Shapeways, uh, depending on who's providing the model for sale, obviously, uh, you you often have quality levels and then post processing. So like you could choose, you could save a few dollars and get like a low quality, which is going to have an even more rough surface, because they're using recycled powder. Mm. or part of the mix and then you could pay a little bit more to get the fine detail which they're using fresh powder so it's not it's you know less fuzzy less less dirty and then post-processing like like Richard was describing for that polished finish even even less of a of a gritty surface so it's it's all the same technology it's just you know whether you're paying for fresh material and then post-processing and stuff that's a good idea. idea. I must try that sometime. I, ha I have a beat blaster here, so I should actually try that. But uh, perhaps, yeah, and, the, and I, perhaps I, the media is a little too fine, though. 
that kind of stuff also works on on the filament based 3d printing you know you just gotta okay. do some testing you know choose the right medium mm -hmm. and pressure and all that stuff and, and blast away some of the layer lines i think the problem with the sls the nylon that uh, shapeways uses is it's actually quite resistant to abrasion yeah. uh, it's very easy to cut um, but it's very difficult to, to sand smooth. I think you do better to build the surface up with primer rather than try to wear the surface down. Um, you can go so far. The only other thing you might want to try, Dennis, to, to, to maintain the, the, um, the detail, I found when I've been sanding poor resin bodies, is I use, um, there's, an, there's an oven cleaning paste on sale in the UK that's got quite a gritty feel to it. I uh -huh. use, a, use a toothbrush and an oven cleaning cleaning paste. I don't think it's not it's not a chemical cleaner. It's actually an abrasive cleaner, uh, and so I think it probably would use with any abrasive powder. But a toothbrush and abrasive powder um, allows you to sand along the lines without losing your shut lines or your door handles. That that can be quite handy. It certainly it's it's much more difficult to flatten a, the, a door handle than if you're using um, a sheet of of wet and dry paper in your hand. True. Okay, I'll try that. That's a good idea. And it's different, like the filament got printers, something interesting again. one it's, of the nice things about the filament printers is that there are, there's a, there's a fairly wide variety of material types that you can print. And you were talking about uh, the ABS and acetone vapor smoothing, which is super easy to do, but it's also super easy to overdo. Uh, and, and what I, what I did was just have a, a container with some acetone in the bottom because you don't put the acetone right on the model. You, you just want the vapors of the acetone to, to get at the model. And I would just hold the model into the, the, the container for just a few seconds and then pull it back out, then turn it around and, and do that. The, it, it's nice that you, that you smooth out the layer lines and it gets all shiny and pretty, but the same thing that's reducing the layer lines is also going to reduce your, your door lines and your other small details on on your model if you know what you're doing greg you can overemphasize those lines you can actually make the lines deeper there you go um, yeah if you're planning on pronounced. the only thing with acetone be very careful don't do it in california because it's got a flash point of 24 degrees centigrade <laughs> and if you open the lid you'll explode <laughs> my uh, my father once blew up a factory with a drum of acetone oh, God. <laughs> He had a 25 gallon drum of acetone that he was using to clean down because he, he, he laid um, acid resistant fiberglass in electroplating. Um, so they, they basically the pits um, that they put the tub of hot acid in, um, the fumes will eventually um, dissolve the concrete. But if you line it with acid resistant fiberglass, it lasts a bit longer. So, and he used acetone to clean it down. Uh, and he'd gone off on a lunch break and he'd left this 25 gallon drum of acetone with lots of um, yellow and black tape around it saying, do not move. When he came back, it had gone. And he said, what have you guys done with this? And a, and a forklift truck driver decided he didn't like it there. He was going to move it. So he put it right next to uh, a vat of hot acid that was at about 100 degrees centigrade. So he just hit the panic button and said, run. And everybody got out of the factory just as it hit the flash point and exploded and it blew the roof off the factory. I know. So don't so blame your dad. Blame that no, idiot. <laughs> it was the idiot. In fact, I mean, now, the, the, nowadays it wouldn't because in, in factories now they build them with glass panels for that very reason. You have, a, you have a section of wall that is actually far less robust than the rest of the building. I mean, if you do get an explosion, it blows that part of wall out and leaves the rest of the building intact. But in those days, no, it was just like... Um, blowing up a balloon it, it literally took the roof off the factory and um yeah the forklift track driver had a lot of explaining to do but yeah acetone nasty stuff and, and some different materials sand better than others you know you, you sanding pla is just a pain like you're saying you want to you just want to go ahead and do a filler primer and sand the primer but some other materials sand just fine you know the pet g and, and you know abs to a certain extent but yeah, there's lots of things to experiment with. The good uh, thing about PLA is that it takes paint really well. It does. Um, what I found yeah. is, 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 you know, you put a you put a primer on PLA, it's never coming off. The adhesion is really good. I think because the PLA plastic is slightly hydroscopic, so it will absorb, uh, try to absorb any liquid you put on the surface. As soon as you spray the paint, it grabs it. 
which is great. So yeah, just keep going with the with the with the primer and uh, and sand it, and you you can end up with a very good finish. Looks like Mark had something you wanted to show us there. Oh, it was just uh, something small. It was from from Shapeways. If you can see, it, it's a twin turbo. Oh, it's just too flashy. I mean, it's, I'm getting too much reflection. It's a twin turbo small block Chevy, a big block Chevy. It's, it's all resin printed, but just the intricacy and the uh, the detail that you get on it is pretty amazing. It's got you know intercooler and uh, anyway, it's just something something nice that they did. And it was one of those that I clicked the button on to get it polished. And it's I wouldn't even bother sanding it. It's just that good. Now, what what scale is that? No, it's one twenty fourth or one twenty fifth. It goes in a. I'm putting it in a sixty three Ford Thunderbolt, but. Chevrolet motor and a Thunderbolt, sacrilege, I know, but it's just, I like both. That's pretty cool. Russ, did you have something you wanted to say or ask? Yeah, I'll do a little share here. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. Slot car track cleaning system. Yes, and it's amazing. This, I bought this about year and a half ago and I just if you guys don't mind I'll show you what it looks like and what it does yeah you guys good for it yep so this is it and give me a second here okay so this is it and if you take this pad off and you hear this each one of these individual weight, there are little weights inside this. And you use Swiffer pads as cleaning pads. It's amazing. I um, take, you know, take your junkyard car, or whatever, and you just push it around your track. I push this thing around my track. I usually do, you know, when I'm getting ready for a race, I'll maybe run 10, 15 laps with this. And that that pad is almost black. You know, if, if the track sits for a while, it also, because of the way it's built, goes down in the slots and so it's pushing your Swiffer pad in the slot also also and it cleans the slot so I think I paid probably 40 bucks for this when I bought it and if you have problems getting all the way around your track I've got some areas that aren't so easy and uh, man this is this is the thing, hot ticket. So, <laughs> nice. I think you posted a video of, of the car pushing it around the track. Yeah, yeah. If you go on my uh, Facebook page or YouTube page, there's a video on it working. I guess you got to clean the track where the car is going to be first. Otherwise, the car doesn't have any traction, right? <laughs> yeah, it could be. That's why well, you got to run a few laps. Enough. What I use uh, for a pusher car. <clears throat> is a uh, heavily weighted Skelectric car. That way, if you, you know, if you, uh, if your track is a little extra dusty, mine, uh, in the case of the big banks, I have, mine will tend to slide down in the, in the rear of the car if I've got dust on the track. So I'll uh, use a heavy weighted car, gets better traction, and it'll just push it right around the track. Now I also have an attachment that I put on the back of one of my cars that is a Swiffer, but it's the Swiffer from, uh, from a hand Swiffer, it's the full pad. So I put that on the back, use some painter's tape, pull that down, and that drags it as I go to the front, the, that will drag it behind the car and clean a little bit wider gap. Works pretty good, but for lanes one and four, 
not as good because if you've got landscape, it'll tend to bump your landscape. But if you landscaped correctly, you don't have the problem anyhow. So I just thought it's cool. Pigeonous oh. thing ever. And it comes with this cool little template to cut new Swiffer pads. <laughs> and just in case you want to know how to get hold of it. <laughs> well, thank you and very I, much. I don't get anything out of pushing this, but this damn thing is good. Yeah. It's at our two hour mark. So thank you very much for sharing that last little bit before we stop the video. I'm going to hit the stop recording button. But you guys are welcome to hang around and chat a little bit longer. But for now, everybody say bye.